Hi everyone, my name is Ruth Wilcock and I'm the Executive Director of the Ontario Brain Injury Association and I want to welcome you to this webinar today. Obaya has been educating people in the field of brain injury for close to 35 years and we are so excited to have this webinar series that we can present to you in collaboration with the Brain Changes Initiative. The Brain Changes Initiative founder is Dr. Matthew Galati. And Dr. Galati sustained a very serious traumatic brain injury in 2013. However, he was able to return to medical school and now is a fully licensed physician. Today, we are so excited to have Dr. O here today presenting. And I can't wait to hear your presentation. However, before you present Dr. O, I'd like to introduce to you our sponsor today, which is Cheryl Kerr, from Medex Health Services. We so appreciate your sponsorship and could not do this without you. So Cheryl, I'd like to give you the opportunity to say a few words and then introduce Dr. O. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cheryl Kerr, the founder and managing partner of Medex Health Services. It is with great pleasure that we take this opportunity to partner with the OBIA in sponsorship of this webinar. I would like to introduce Dr. Paul Ho, cardiologist and medical director of the Cardiovascular Preven Prevention and Rehabilitation Programs at TRI and PNCC. Dr. Ho has authored over 250 peer-reviewed publications in the principal invest investor and investigator and a number of grants examining behavioral and educational intervention for the prevention and management of cardiovascular conditions, diabetes, chronic diseases, and exercise. He has participated in many national advisory communities around heart, health, and policies. Dr. Ho currently serves as an associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and the Chair of Good Life Fitness. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Paul Ho. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that uh, kind introduction. And we're very grateful to MedEx for sponsoring this event and Ob Obaya and uh, the Brain Changes uh, Initiative for making uh, this series possible. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be with you today to share uh, some thoughts about this topic uh, around, uh, I'm putting in quotation marks, holistic approaches uh, and, and featuring the brain-heart connection. Um, the, the outline for this uh, next 40 to 45 minutes uh, consists of these major points that uh, hopefully we will all come to appreciate, and I'm sure we already do, that the brain and heart are indeed integrally connected uh, and thus, what we do uh, in a good or a bad way uh, will affect both our brains and our hearts. So let's use our powers for good and think about ways that we can improve both our brain and heart health uh, through major things uh, that or major interventions that focus around risk factor management, uh, as well as health behavioral approaches. And um, you, we will hopefully be able to convey um, that uh, working on these uh, major uh, items will impact indeed on physical and mental health. Um, and perhaps one personal goal that uh, I have uh, in terms of presenting this is that there will be one thing, just one thing that you might find for yourself, for your family, maybe you'll be able to launch it over this upcoming long weekend. Okay, we've got a lot of stuff to cover off. Uh, I did want to start off with a call out to the term holistic. Um, and, and I apologize. Let me start by, by apologizing for those of you who might have been tuning into this session, perhaps with an expectation that I would be covering off uh, a great deal around alternative therapies, Ayurvedic, traditional medicines, supplements. Um, I recognize that all of those uh, approaches are incredibly important, but I would be doing them a disservice if I was the one speaking to them. Um, my, my approach to holistic medicine uh, kind of goes back to, uh, I guess, the, 
the, the more um, colloquial definitions of holistic in, in that we focus on whole people rather than focusing narrowly on a single thing. It's not just a heart, it's not just a brain, it's not one particular symptomatology, but rather the things that we can do in kind of more comprehensive healthcare or wellness approaches that I know all of the folks on the, on the line embrace is looking at the connections between the mind and the body, the brain and the heart. Uh, and and th that's gonna be my uh, sort of uh, uh, approach to this topic. So um, we'll have some focus, but gosh, there's going to be a lot of material that we'll cover off in the next little while. But there may be some things that I won't get to that you will recognize as critically important. And perhaps that that's fodder for uh, future topics that, that may come up in a series like this. We don't have to look very far uh, for uh, kind of editorial statements or guidances about uh, connections between a brain and heart. And you know, if we look at a, a, a reputable reference like the Centers for Disease Control in the States, that uh, they have uh, some nice materials on their page that is uh, devoted to the connections between brain health and heart health and the call out that by keeping one's heart healthy, that we can also lower our risk for brain problems. And a couple of prototypes for this would be stroke and dementia, relevant to the, the sponsors and, and the kind of the framework for this talk uh, for these sessions would be that other kinds of traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury, I, I think would also share many of these uh, sorts of aspects. And when I've had personal discussions with uh, Dr. Galati and, and colleagues that uh, we, we recognize that there is a lot of commonality in the work that I might do in cardiovascular care and the work that they are championing uh, for brain injury recovery. Uh, th there's a lot of common elements that we'll go through uh, in the next little while. Um, we could look at um, kind of the, the overarching themes that the CDC might bring out just to talk about what do we mean specifically as examples of unhealthy heart, unhealthy brain? Well, we know as a prototype, for instance, that an unhealthy heart may be characterized by an acute episode like a heart attack that happens when there is buildup of plaque or blood clot that causes interruption of blood flow in the heart and then heart, a part of the heart is, is compromised. Uh, another example would be a stroke in the brain uh, and it might be characterized as a so-called brain attack. We could also uh, introduce here the notion of brain injuries as another acute form of, of a brain attack. Uh, and this may happen when there is a clot or a plaque blocking a blood vessel in the brain, I guess that's from the inside, there may be also external forces that may impact on our brain to cause injury. When this happens, brain tissue may be affected, some of it may actually die and become compromised. And this will manifest in memory loss, disability, often changes in mood and behavior as well. So that's the commonality, I think, in, in these sorts of syndromes. A prototype of heart and stroke coming together in the vascular arena is a, is a syndrome that may affect people in later life, uh, a type of dementia called vascular dementia, where there are a series of small strokes or mini strokes that may compound and again manifest as memory loss, disability, loss of motor function, changes in behavior, changes in mood. So we have these kind of common pathways that really do connect together our hearts, our brains, and our vascular systems. And when one looks at you know, the, the, the vast landscape of research that has been done in heart health, and brain health and vascular health, uh, I think we can distill out that there are a number of interventions that have been proven uh, that can actually impact our trajectories, help us uh, think about our lives now while we may be healthy or living with a condition and then looking towards the future of how do we have good quality years ahead of us. Um, and, and perhaps I've been together with you on other sessions where we've generated a top 10 list. Well, this is uh, a, probably a similar kind of list um, that will try to touch on more about aspects of brain health, touching upon memory, cognition, and mood uh, to make this 
kind of uh, very uh, much more appropriate for this session and this audience. So we're going to talk about blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and then under the health behaviors, eating healthy foods, limiting alcohol and smoke, being active, physically being active, cognitively sleeping well and trying to stress less. Um, and again, here is a top 10 list. So if you can pick one, just one to work on over the next little while, then, you know, mission accomplished for the end of the session. So let's talk about step number one in blood pressure and why this is so common. Well, high blood pressure is very common overall in the adult population starting in our 40s. It might affect you know, one in eight or one in seven. And as we get to our older years, it may affect one in two individuals walking about. So uh, high blood pressure is not so much uh, uh, seen as a disease then, but it might just be a variation uh, of, of a physiologic condition that affects so many people. The reason that it's quite challenging is that we recognize high blood pressure as a leading cause for both heart disease and even maybe more importantly, stroke. So affecting our brain health uh, just as much as our heart health. Um, uh, over time, the consequence of repeated uh, or, or sustained high blood pressure is that there is too much stress on blood vessels that may actually cause blood vessels to narrow down and restrict blood flow or for small vulnerable vessels actually make them more prone to burst open. And particularly those small vessels in the brain may have this propensity. Um, the other recognition over, over the last number of years is that there is also a relationship between high blood pressure that occurs in younger to middle years to a development of cognitive decline and dementia later in life. And that's maybe the newer angle that we want to surface for today. So part one, blood pressure control predicts stroke has been well characterized for many years. And this graph that represents the experiences of thousands of men in a cohort, they, um, they were looked at at time zero. And over the course of the next 14 years, the number of people who experienced a stroke uh, were, were counted up over this period of time. So you can see that the squiggly line represents one stroke event in, in, in each of the categories. The interesting thing here was that the population was broken down according to blood pressure levels at time of entry into this observational study. Um, the blue line represents people with perfectly normal blood pressures, let's say 120 over 80. The green line and the red line interestingly represent people that were also having, quote, normal blood pressure, but they were not quite as good as the optimal level. So normal blood pressure might have denoted a number of 130 over 85, which is quite normal in everybody's textbooks. And the high normal people were, were had a blood pressure of say 139 over 89. You know, given that the definition of high blood pressure is 140 over 90, these folks would have been, been called normal. But I think we would all appreciate that the red line the green line and the blue line are actually quite different in terms of experiences of bad vascular events like stroke over a period of, of uh, 12 to 14 years. And in fact, the people with quote, high normal blood pressure had a rate of stroke that was three times higher than those with perfectly normal, optimal blood pressure. It, it makes us rethink what is quote normal versus what is abnormal. So blood pressure control predicts vascular events like stroke. And perhaps we wouldn't be surprised then that blood pressure also predicts cognitive decline. So this study that was published uh, recently in the journal called Hypertension looked at a large cohort of individuals, in this case, uh, 6,000 men and women uh, who were followed over a period of, of several years. And they also had their blood pressure categorized at baseline. And then they underwent tests of memory, language fluency, and executive function, you know, higher levels of brain function. And this was followed over a period of time uh, over the number of years. And what was very interesting was that the presence of high blood pressure or even borderline high blood pressure predicted a faster decline in um, tests of memory, 
language fluency and executive function uh, over time. Um, so the flip of this is that if one can control blood pressure, you may actually preserve brain function as well. So think of that if you might have a family history of high blood pressure coming up, or if there might be other reasons that might put us at compromise, like uh, if our brain um, structure activity might have been affected uh, at a younger age, how do we keep our brains healthier down the road? We'll control this risk factor as one option. Turning to some other, so uh, how do we best control our blood pressures? Well, number one is get to know your numbers and get them checked regularly. And for many people, I, I, I might actually advise getting a, si a simple device uh, for measurement at home. And you know, these sorts of automated digital devices cost about $100 and uh, will last several years and work very, very accurately. Uh, and probably the measurements that you take at home over a longer period of time are the best index of control. Control. If your blood pressure is high, chat with your doctor, nurse, healthcare team to make it uh, to manage it best. Uh, we may need medicines, but for many others, eating well and being active may be outstanding ways of achieving control. In addition to other sorts of of, of interventions like uh, yoga, meditation, paying attention to to our energy, and, and these sorts of things. So this is truly a holistic kind of intervention that we can set out around blood pressure. Okay, number two uh, on our risk factor cascade would be thinking about diabetes. And we know diabetes affects a large segment of our population in Canada. Uh, perhaps one in three Canadians are affected by frank uh, diabetes diagnosis, perhaps a diagnosis of diabetes that we're not aware of, or a tendency for uh, abnormal blood sugar control, either first thing in the morning or after a meal, so-called prediabetes. Uh, we recognize that this is a problem in terms of cardiovascular system, as well as the rest of the body, because diabetes is associated with damage to blood vessels and nerves, raising the risk for heart disease, stroke. But there is also a literature that talks about diabetes and cognitive function. Um, and it's, it's interesting that a, uh, a, um, a growing number of studies uh, provide evidence that diabetes actually raises the risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. And it may be related to complex regulatory pathways for how we handle sugar and insulin in our brains, as well as the rest of our body, the development of small vessel disease, as we talked about for high blood pressure. Uh, and it's interesting that these are the same sorts of issues that may develop, uh, lead to the development of Alzheimer's disease, as well as for vascular forms of, of cognitive impairments. So both of these things may be in play uh, when, we, when we're living with diabetes. It's been Im importantly identified that having really good sugar control, if we're living with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, as well as managing risk factors, is really great for producing heart disease risk, reducing blindness risk, reducing kidney problems, but also very important in avoiding cognitive complications down the road. And then one other feature of diabetes care that we should be aware of is avoidance of low blood sugars, particularly in children and particularly in the, in the elderly. So don't go too high for diabetes, but also be mindful of therapies that may cause sugars to go too low because that's also uh, very bad for, for brain health. Step number three deals with cholesterol and this lovely uh, illustration uh, really shows very nicely where cholesterol builds up in the wall of the arteries. This is a process that takes years or decades in time, may lead to constriction of blood vessels, reduction in flow, uh, or actually frank blockages when you couple the cholesterol buildup with activation of clotting that will happen. So this is the, the propagation of heart attack and stroke, and we're very aware of that. So one quick way of representing decades of, of, of uh, clinical trials with hundreds of thousands of people across many therapies that involve medicines and diets, as well as other approaches to lowering cholesterol would yield this kind of relationship 
where if we looked at the bad cholesterol le levels on the lower scale here, uh, this is LDL cholesterol, um, and the higher the cholesterol is, the greater the risk for heart disease. And you can see that there is a striking linear relationship. And um, perhaps there is actually not a real lower level. This is very low cholesterol levels in Canadian SI units. This is an LDL level of one millimole per liter. So getting down to extremely low levels has been associated with lower heart disease risk, lower stroke risk. And the reason that's important vis-a-vis -vis the brain is that if we look at the the importance of vascular protection over decades, that people who accumulate small strokes, vascular plugging of small vessels, you know, the interaction of diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol may lead to this syndrome called vascular dementia. And, and this is something called a positron emission tomography scan, a PET scan of the brain, over here is a normal, healthy brain that has lots of, of vibrant, high, high color tissue, meaning that there's lots of good blood flow and metabolic activity. On the right-hand side, we see that this is a brain uh, that has been affected by repeated insults over time. You can see that the brain tissue has shrunken over time. The, the dark areas represent the fluid cavities that are in the brain uh, called the ventricula, and, and those are relatively expanded in proportion to the amount of brain tissue here. And there's abnormal lighting up of normal kinds of activities. So we would not be surprised that function will be compromised, memory will be compromised, mood will be compromised, behavior will be compromised by all of this. Uh, so this is what is at stake in terms of risk factor control and, and the importance of vascular protection. Okay, so that's the medical kind of angle, but to be more comprehensive and to be more whole person and holistic in nature, we wanted to turn to some of our health behaviors, the things that are under our control. Uh, for those of you who tuned in a couple of weeks ago in this series, there was a marvelous session delivered by Dr. Mary Sko, uh, who uh, talked about all of the ways to be healthy for the body as well as for the brain. Um, and, and this is just a tiny little uh, snippet of, of the things that she shared with us around eating lots of vegetables and fruits and whole grains and low fat dairy and seafood rich in omega-3s, limiting foods that may not be so healthy for our brains, such as refined sugars and saturated fats. Uh, the added um, kind of component that we'll call out for cardiovascular health uh, will be to lower or or regulate our sodium intake as well, because we know that sodium infects our blood pressure, makes it go up, and then we have that whole cascade going on with vascular complications. Um, I, I chatted with our dietitian who works in our program um, and uh, about her experiences in working with people who are, who are having heart problems. And she shared with me, of course, that the things that we do for the heart or recommend for the heart are, of course, good for the brain as well. Um, in our cardiovascular rehabilitation program that we provide a great deal of evidence-based individual individualized nutrition counseling uh, for people and their families. And I think the cornerstones, although all programs may be quite individualized in nature, depending on um, the, the experiences that we might have had, are we living with a heart condition? Are we living with diabetes? Do we have kidney complications as well uh, that might need to some, lead to some customization? Um, I, I think we would agree uh, for most people that uh, espousing or adhering to principles like Mediterranean or DASH patterns of eating are, are, are probably in play for most people. Uh, and, and at the foundations of this would be uh, emphasizing more plant-based whole foods. There's no one single thing. There's no one single supplement that, that's going to be the magic uh, answer for everything, but it's thinking about the whole pattern. And, you know, the, 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 the photo here uh, kind of represents a dietitian laying out the, the healthy examples of things that we can eat in totality. 
Um, I'm also calling out here a resource that's, that's available to everybody here. Uh, if you log on to our uh, a patient education resource called the Healthy University, um, one of the subsets of that is called Cardiac College, where we have a lot of materials uh, there for sharing, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, why do we focus on, on Mediterranean diets as a pattern or a style or a way to live? is that emphasizing all of these things in a pyramidal fashion where we get more fruits and vegetables and grains and uh, nuts and seeds and oils and add in healthy proteins on top of that is that we know from big studies like the PREDIMED study that if you follow the pattern that you can lower your risk of developing heart complications by about 30%, and, and 30% in particular lowering, lowering of heart attack or stroke risk. Uh, and if you've actually experienced one of these events, that you're, if you get into this pattern as a de novo thing, you can lower your chance of a second event by 50 to 70%. The, the companion to this that, that uh, Dr. Mary talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago is that you can also improve one's brain health by lowering the risk of developing cognitive impairments or lowering the risk of Frank Alzheimer's disease through this. So food is quite powerful um, as, an, as an intervention to preserve heart and brain health. DASH is another one that we talked about, uh, dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. Again, a lot of similarity in the, the pyramidal pattern, emphasizing fruits and veg and whole grains and nuts and seeds, limiting salt and sugar uh, at the top of this. Um, for the blood pressure intervention, what was very interesting that in a relatively short period of time, like only 12 weeks, one can achieve a blood pressure reduction by about 11 over five, 11 systolic, five diastolic. And that is as powerful as any medicine that I might offer you. Uh, so you can do that with, with a dietary kind of shift in, in, in patterns. On the brain side, what was also shown from, from DASH types of patterns is that we can improve cognitive performance like psychomotor speed. You know, if you're a rat, how fast can you get through a labyrinth? If I give you a written test, how well can you get through a, a trail or, or, or a list of, of, of verbal tasks and learn and memorize those things? So there are interestingly interest, out, interesting outcomes that can be achieved with changing patterns of eating, especially if we couple that with exercise programming. Of course, I'm a big fan of physical activity and exercise, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. So some of the resources that we can also share with you at, at our web platform would be a whole series about healthy food choices. How do you get through a grocery store and make choices that would be compatible with a Mediterranean pattern of eating or uh, a DASH type of program. So uh, we'd invite you to visit the website, uh, watch a video such as how to choose a healthy bread, even download a clip uh, about um, uh, or download a, a tip card on how you uh, can choose the healthy uh, choice, look at a, a, um, a nutrition label and decipher all of that stuff. So uh, all of this is available to you. And if you're curious about uh, assessing your own pattern of eating, then you can take the Mediterranean diet quiz that is available on the website as well. So score yourself on uh, the amount of olive oil, vegetables, fruits, proteins that you ingest, salt and sugar that you might ingest. Um, and, you know, you'll get a score on the scale. And uh, the, the, the interactive um, uh, platform will also provide you with some tips on how you might yourself become a little bit more Mediterranean. Another lovely uh, guide that we've been using in our program, for, especially for uh, promotion of brain health, uh, quite appropriately, is called the Brain Health Food Guide, developed by uh, leading nutritionists at the Baycrest um, uh, uh, Health Center. And we've been using this together in a research study that we've been involved with to try to help individuals with vascular risk factors preserve brain health. So uh, I, I don't think you would be surprised that the Brain Health Food Guide would be patterned after uh, evidence based in the Mediterranean patterns or the DASH patterns. Uh, and the foods to include would, it, would, would uh, emphasize things like vegetables, 
vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds and uh, fish and seafood and limit uh, you know, things that may be less preferred. Um, I'm sorry, potato chips and cookies go on to perhaps the naughty list while fruits and vegetables will be on the good list. Simple diet changes can have a powerful effect on brain health. And, and when one looks for outcomes that might be associated with this pattern of eating, uh, our colleagues at Baycrest showed that after only four months of eating well, older adults performed on some of these cognitive tests as though they were nine years younger in terms of reading and writing. So we may be able to turn back the clocks in a few different ways. Um, and individuals who were able to sustain a pattern of eating when they were at risk for developing cognitive decline, well, they were able to really turn back the clock and, and uh, kind of mirror individuals who did not have any memory losses at all. So um, important things that we can embrace in the day. Part of this pattern of, of healthy uh, eating and ingestion also calls out to, to alcohol. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the, the greater emerging body of evidence would be to say, we, we need to be careful here. You know, for a while we were saying, oh gosh, drink, uh, drink regularly. That's probably good for your heart health. And to some degree that is true, but um, I, I think the totality of evidence as we continue to look at this is that, yes, you may drink and you may drink as part of a Mediterranean pattern of eating. So having a glass of wine with a social network where you're having lots of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and healthy proteins, that probably works very well. But, you know, drinking on its own, I, I think it's hard for us to say that that in itself is healthy. We are uh, aware all too much that drinking um, can raise blood pressure, can lead to stroke, can re lead to um, kind of other adverse effects on the heart. And we're also aware that alcohol can negatively impact mood and cognition. Um, and during pandemic, there might be an interesting kind of call out here that we are, of course, aware during the pandemic that there's been a tremendous mental health burden. This recent survey conducted through Statistics Canada reported that, you know, um, uh, one out of two Canadians, almost that, uh, are reporting feelings of loneliness and isolation. And this is associated with a much higher prevalence of depression and anxiety and probably post-traumatic stress disorders as well. There is also this interesting and remarkable gradient uh, by age in our populations where especially younger individuals have been affected by loneliness, by anxiety, by depression. Uh, and I'm sure we've all seen this in our families as well. The connection to the, to the last points are that different um, generational kind of bands have reacted or responded to these mental health burdens in different ways. And our younger and younger segments of our population, millennials and Gen Xers have been turning to alcohol and tobacco and cannabis and junk food as ways of quote coping uh, with the kind of the difficult feelings that they are experiencing. Well, on the other hand, the boomers and the greatest generation, the, uh, the, the, the older segments of our population have actually interestingly be turn, been turning to exercise either outside or exercise inside if they had a particular risk or concern about pandemic. So th this is very important to recognize um, because we, re we know that uh, based on our preceding discussion, drinking more, smoking more, eating bad things has only a bad thing associated with, with it down the road. So this is a chance for us to turn this. And if we think of wave four of pandemic, it may be a very long lasting wave. And you know, there are various definitions or concerns about what is the next wave of pandemic. Maybe touch wood, it won't be COVID per se, but it's the aftermath of COVID, such as uh, you know, catching up on surgery and heart disease and chronic disease. But there's also this kind of legacy of, of adverse health behaviors that have been created during the pandemic. And hopefully this is not something that will persist, but if it does, that's going to be a devastating wave uh, for the future to compound the devastating wave that we have been in. 
Um, we know that many people might turn to alcohol as something to, quote, take the edge off of things. Uh, we recognize that this may be a short term thing that, you know, for some people may actually help them feel better in some ways to help them, quote, relax. Um, but this is not something that uh, that actually will lead to long term solutions. And there is so much literature uh, uh, that associates alcohol with uh, heightened anxiety down the road, more depression, uh, more stress, and, and in addition to the physical things that can come on down the road. So we just need to be really, really aware of this and, and, and be uh, prepared to help each other uh, kind of get to more positive health behaviors. Smoking, you know, um, there's lots of bad things that are associated with smoking, uh, including our vascular health uh, and, you know, the, the guidelines that existed before exist now. Don't smoke. It's the most important thing that we can do for our heart health. And it's never really too late to quit. Um, around brain health, there is actually some interesting literature that we might call out here um, with some cautions, right? So uh, some people smoke because they think that they can perform better. And it's maddening uh, when, when, you know, for those of us, and I'm sure I, uh, there's many people online that will um, uh, kind of be able to identify with this. When you're watching the latest movie or, or series on, uh, on our favorite streaming kind of channel, I, I, it's, it's remarkable how many that have smoking as part of it. So, you know, it's, it's often the, um, the protagonist, whether it's a uh, heroic detective or somebody else that's trying to solve a mystery. You know, uh, I'm calling out... Uh, um, um, the, the serpent as, as one thing that we binged recently where uh, for those of you who saw it, you know where I'm going with this, that, you know, the diplomat who unravels the case and is so pr persistent is a terrible chain smoker. It, it makes me crazy that these things are, are featured here, but, you know, it seems that when this person's under tremendous mental distress that they turn to the cigarette and, and chain smoke. Um, and, and I guess what it calls out to, um, to, to folks is that people may turn to smoking cigarettes in particular as a temporary way to enhance cognitive functioning because nicotine, sure, it, it actually is a powerful chemical that's highly addictive. Um, and if you're deficient in nicotine, it's actually hard to perform well. So smoking something may enhance cognitive performance in the short term. And it actually helps one deal with this thing that I'm going through with withdrawal. Um, what it says to me is that smoking is, is bad because nicotine is so addictive um, that gets people hooked so much that they need the nicotine to perform at a normal level. Um, and, and we're just kind of reinforcing this, this terrible cascade of turning to nicotine. But what it also says to me uh, is that nicotine is so powerful that it gets so much of the population hooked, hooked and addicted that people feel like they can't perform unless they've got this on board. Heavy smoking is associated with cognitive impairment and cognitive decline. So the things that we might do in younger years will catch up to us, not only in vascular health, but it catches up to, also, to us also in brain health. And why is this important? That many folks that might have some cognitive or mood impairments have a much higher rate of smoking. So this is one of the things that actually will lead to worse brain health down the road. And we need to identify this, be aware of it, help our colleagues get over this as well. And, and a reminder that it may take 13 times on average to successfully quit. That's how powerful nicotine is. Be physically active because that's going to address everything that we've talked about. All of the risk factors, the food behaviors, the smoking behaviors, all of it. Um, and the sad reality is that most Canadians don't get enough. Uh, so find ways to get active. And I know you've had some great sessions here uh, around the connections between physical activity and brain health. And we need to customize this. You know, while it's great to put out these guidelines, oh, go get active, go out for a run. We know that individuals with certain kinds of conditions, whether it's cardiac or brain or traumatic brain injury, may benefit best from a controlled kind of program. So finding the right level, and it might be um, just getting going and moving from uh, the couch to just walking is a great thing. For some, walking to getting more active is a great thing. 
being mindful of symptoms and not overdoing things that will exacerbate things like headaches or, or mental fog. Uh, and for some people, you know, the thing that might do the trick is from going from moderate levels of activities to higher levels of activities and sometimes going back and forth. So customization of physical activity is critically important. And that's why structured programming with professionals may be the right way to go if one is embarking on a program de novo. Being mindful that not just the 30 minutes a day or 150 minutes, but it's what you do with your whole 24 hours a day. And the most recent Canadian movement guidelines that go over 24 hours, 24 hour movement guidelines is really quite critical here. So think about every day and what you're gonna do throughout the day. And it might include 30 minutes of physical activity aerobic, it might include some muscle strengthening, but it's also hopefully gonna include light physical activities, including standing, throughout the day. And the counterpart to physical activity is this, that we sleep well. I'll talk about it here for physical restoration, and we'll talk a little bit more about mental restoration a little bit. And then also being very mindful of sedentary time and, and not spending too much time. Um, I appreciate that you have taken some time of your lunch hour and agreed to be sedentary with me, but maybe some of you are actually standing or walking around while you're on this session. Terrific. If you're not, then give yourself the gift of a break a little bit later to um, actually counteract the effects of this sedentary episode that we've engaged in right now. Um, we know that physical activity is good for the mind um, and um, that there's great studies that have talked about being active, like running or walking or moderate activity, that we can reduce our risk of depression. And the, the impacts may be just as powerful as medication interventions. And we're delighted that exercise is now recommended in some mental health guidelines as well. We're also very much aware that the, the effects just keep giving and giving and giving that improve your mood, improve your cognition, improve your sleep, improve your confidence, improve your immunity. The only thing that physical activity and exercise don't do is improve your smell, but that's okay. You can get over that as well. That's a temporary measure. Exercise in your brain, well, it's very interesting the connections here, is that um, aerobic activity and resistance activity actually improve your brain structure, the hippocampus, we'll talk a little bit more here. Um, and it may in improve insulin resistance and it may improve growth factors, chemicals that affect brain health and brain cells. So in a stylized way, the hippocampus is this central governor in the middle of your brain, well protected, but also vulnerable because there's lots of things that insult it, like vascular uh, uh, factors like inflammation that, that can attack parts of the brain. Um, the size of the hippocampus tends to shrink over time and it tends to shrink with injury and it tends to shrink with heart disease and, 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 and strokes. So very, very vulnerable. This is where mood and memory are controlled and size does matter. Bigger hippocampus means better mood, better memory. And there are ways of turning on the hippocampus, just like we might feed our plants. We can feed our brains with this stuff called uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor. Like, you know, if I, if I, if I use a, a brand name of a, of a fertilizer, it's like miracle grow for your brain. How do you get more of this stuff? Well, there's some interesting articles that have been published about brain-derived neurotropic factor and how we can enhance this. Well, here is a, a, a kind of mechanistic sort of picture that would say that aging, Alzheimer's disease, stress, I would add in vascular or other kinds of injuries, uh, lead to changes and down regulation in the amount of healthy brain-derived neurotropic factor that we get. Whereas exercise enriching environments that, that stimulate our brains and perhaps some medication approaches will give us more BDNF. More BDNF leads to bigger hippocampus, leads to better mood and memory, and that's where we need to get to. An example of this would be our, our really... Um, well-constructed exercise programs that we do for people with heart disease, but we also offer them for people with stroke. 
over here, this tiny little individual here uh, is named Susan Marzellini, who's a brilliant PhD researcher who is leading our programs in terms of exercise interventions for uh, improving not only fitness for people who've had a stroke, but also cognitive and physical outcomes. And what we can show that, you know, if you exercise with uh, walking and cycling and doing treadmill stuff, you can gain muscle mass. That's great for a, a person who's had a stroke or a person who's had heart disease. But if you layer in weight training as well, we can uh, um, amplify this multiple fold. Why is this important for the brain? Is that if we look at also um, cognitive function, for people who've had a stroke. At baseline, if we look at the number of individuals or the proportion of individuals that might score poorly on a cognitive screen, well, that's about two out of three uh, people with stroke have significant cognitive impairment. By doing a, uh, an exercise program and improving muscle mass, well, we can also show that cognition improves dramatically in this group as well, so that only about one out of three individuals, instead of two out of three individuals, have significant cognitive impairment. And this leads to other kinds of train your brain programs that are also really important. There are other that are much more qualified to speak about this than I, but think about brain training to go beyond the physical. So let's get mentally stimulated uh, and develop uh, social stimulation, environmental stimulation, be active throughout this to build back up our cognitive reserves uh, so that uh, we have better brain function going forward. Sleep is incredibly important as part of this as well. Sleep is important in terms of cardiovascular health because if you don't sleep well you can get more risk factors that leads to more heart failure heart attack stroke diabetes but we might also think of sleep on the left hand side of this panel as a way of cleaning out the brain clearing out toxic beta amyloid waste products beta amyloid is the stuff that gets laid down with alzheimer's disease and you might actually be able to clear this out just by sleeping well. So that's really critically important. And on a related note, if we get stressed out all the time, well, that's just um, kind of uh, bombarding our brains and our hippocampus all the time uh, with stressors. Um, and and the, clearly this is not a positive thing for us to do. We can't avoid stress, but we can change our responses to stress and, and do that in a really, really positive way. Okay, I am wrapping up, thank goodness. Well, uh, you know, kind of summative statements that are going around the world. So um, for brain injury, as well as for dementia, on a global basis, I think more and more people are recognizing this really tight connection between the heart and the brain, risk factors, health behaviors, uh, and, so, and so much so that the global uh, kind of consortium against dem dementia would say, regular physical activity, management of cardiovascular risk factors are associated with a reduced risk of cognitive decline, reduce the risk of dementia, focus on healthy diets, lifelong learning, cognitive training, all of these things are critically important. And that brings me to the end of this session. Uh, and we set out at the beginning that we were going to go on a discussion where we described how the brain and heart that are indeed are connected. We described interventions that can help out both at the same time, and that risk factor management and health behavior approaches are all critically important along this. And uh, I think we've, we've shared some information that uh, any one of these things can have a big impact on physical and mental health. And together, they can have a dramatic impact on what help happens to us in the short term, as well as for the rest of our lives. And hopefully you've been able to find one thing for yourself out of all of this. Okay, so that's the end of this formal part. Uh, I note that uh, folks may be interested in, in, in getting more information or, or getting a copy of these slides. And indeed, we will make a copy of, of the slides available to you um, um, so that you might be able to reflect on it a little bit later. Um, and, and we'll do that uh, through uh, our, our colleagues at Obaya and Brain Changes. Hey, Matt, nice to see you. Uh, and we'll turn it to you now. Hey, Paul, I just wanted to... Thank you for giving such an amazing presentation uh, around the connection between brain and heart health. Uh, what's, what's heart healthy truly is brain healthy and um, you know, it's a strong connection. So thank you for so eloquently describing that. 
Uh, I'd also like to thank MedEx Health Services for sponsoring Dr. O's talk. And I would also like to thank Obaya. We're so privileged to bring these uh, webinars to our audience and I've partnered with such an amazing organization to do so. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Matthew Galati. I'm the founder of Brain Changes Initiative. Uh, Brain Changes was founded back in 2019 and it was inspired largely by, well, actually was inspired by my own recovery from traumatic brain injury. Um, our mission is to fund groundbreaking research to help improve the standard of care for traumatic brain injury. And we also strive to spread awareness, bring education and support for TBI patients, their families, healthcare providers, and people who just want to live a brain healthy lifestyle. So that's why we do, uh, we host events like this and please follow us at brain changes. Uh, we have a lot of great information on our Instagram page. So Paul, there are uh, a number of questions for you. Uh, so let's get started here. What is the latest medical advice for cholesterol um, and fat in one's diet and health? Gosh, that's a, so uh, great question. Thank you. A uh, long answer to that. The, the short answer is, uh, you know, tight relationships um, the, of cholesterol and outcomes. Uh, so, so that part, I, I think we made clear. Um, benefits from uh, different approaches or a number of approaches to reducing cholesterol vis-a-vis -vis vascular risk. In terms of dietary fats, I recognize that this is a little bit more controversial uh, and that... Um, you know, so diet quality overall that can include healthy fats in the diet. Uh, I think perhaps that's that message was lost over the years. So you can have fat in your diet and still be very, very healthy, but still you can make quality choices amongst the fats that you choose for heart and brain health. There's a much longer answer to that one, but let me let me just end it there, Matt. No, that was a great answer. And I just wanted to add to that and I guess bring it back to Mary Sko's uh, presentation where she emphasized the importance of omega-3 fatty acids and how omega-3 fatty acids make up one third of our brain. So, and they're antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. So not only do they have these profound functional effects on the brain, but it also is a huge structural component of the brain itself. Um, so next question, are there warning signs for plaque buildup in the heart that we can pay attention to? Are they different for men and women? Yeah, super. Uh, thanks for that. And um, so as plaque builds up in the in the first uh, in the first stages, when there's just a little bit of plaque in arteries, you may not experience anything uh, new in terms of symptomatology. As it progresses along, some of the classic warning signs, of course, are development of angina or chest discomfort, tightness that may be the center or left part of the chest may go down the arm, may go up to the neck. For women in particular, it may go into the back as well. Uh, some women may experience other kinds of symptomatology, like just shortness of breath or unusual fatigue or tiredness. This tends to be a later phenomenon when there is uh, more buildup of those arteries. Um, sometimes you and your physician or nurse practitioner may decide to go for some other kinds of screening tests where blood vessels, may, you can take some pictures of them using ultrasound or other things. Um, so th there may be some other approaches to, to kind of detecting this a, a little bit earlier on. Generally, we'll say, you know, follow your recommendations of your great family practice team, get the screenings done, look at your risk factors over time, and that's probably going to be the best approach to staying healthy over the long term. Um, there's another question here. Um, what is the association between caffeine and brain health? Caffeine and brain health. So um, I, I would say it's a neutral one. That is that there isn't, um, um, uh, you know, a signal that says caffeine is bad or good for the brain. We know for short-term performance, and I think we live, all of us, this, almost all of us live this every day, that, you know, caffeine is a bit of a stimulant. And some people might need that first caffeine hit in the morning to get going. It makes you a little bit more focused, a little bit more aware, and that's great. Uh, some people have written about you know, can you have too much caffeine and can you become caffeine toxic? And indeed, uh, you can do the fun experiment yourself over the weekend if you want, uh, that you'll get jittery, your, your heart rate may go up, your blood pressure may go up. And uh, one would imagine that over a long term, if you did that for a long time, that that may not be the best thing for your health. But there really isn't great evidence that says if you're a heavy caffeine user, that blood pressure will be sustained and not 
So, you know, I, I come back to moderation. Some coffee, tea, I think is a great idea for most people. If it helps you perform, I, I think that's a good, safe thing to do. Uh, so another question is a great question, but it may merit uh, a very long answer. Mm. Uh, so what are the comparisons between keto, paleo, uh, vega diets with DASH and Mediterranean diets as uh, these are all different, but have impacts on cholesterol, diabetes, and health, and health conditions. Yeah, super. Um, and yeah, I think Matt, uh, the, the 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 answer that deserves is probably a whole session, right, about yes. keto and paleo and and everything. Um, uh, so I would say that whatever pattern of eating that you're choosing, if it's working for you, then I'm a big fan. So that that's great. Be mindful of the outcome that one is trying to achieve with whatever pattern. Um, and if it's for weight loss, then that, that's your focus, great. If it's for sugar control using uh, keto or fat, intermittent fasting, then look at that as your outcome. Think of something though that you can look to for the long term and, and try not to miss out on things that might actually be important for you. So I, I do think that probably the best evidence uh, and why we talk about Mediterranean or other things is that, you know, that those are studies where there's hundreds of thousands of people that have been looked at for cardiovascular or cancer or other kinds of outcomes. So do wait in that way as well. So if the latest fad is try this for weight loss, then um, just kind of weigh that against other things, literally, and perhaps in another session, invite in a, a nutrition expert and have that fulsome discussion. Yep. And I, I did want to uh, point out here that you know, there's a lot of discussion around the ketogenic diet and brain health. Um, the ketogenic diet has been researched uh, most extensively in the context of uh, drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, it's actually been shown to raise this, this seizure, the seizure threshold. Um, we do know that refined carbs in general are not brain healthy, uh, but, you know, it's not to say that eliminating carbs completely should be, you know, as recommended either a fine balance, but we do know that high glycemic carbs and refined carbs are, are harmful to the brain. So again, it's all about balance. Those are great points, Matt. Uh, so, okay, last question. Is increased cholesterol linked to inflammation? Uh, yes, uh, and I think those things go hand in hand in terms of conditions that would kind of predispose one to higher levels of cholesterol uh, often are associated with inflammation going on. And both of these things are usually in play when we think about vascular disease. So the, 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 the built of a plaque in the artery is not just cholesterol, but there's lots of inflammation that's going on in there. Uh, the corollary is the interventions that we would think of. Uh, whether it's cholesterol reduction, blood pressure reduction, not smoking, eating well, getting active, all of those things might have a cholesterol effect, a cholesterol lowering effect, but they also have an anti-inflammatory effect. So both of those things coupled together. Uh, thanks for the, the question. All right. Uh, so on that note, I'll hand it over to Ruth. A special thanks again to Dr. O. That was a wonderful presentation. How you presented was so clear and understandable, and I'm sure that everyone has taken something from your presentation that we can apply to our lives. I want to also thank MedEx Health Services again for sponsoring our webinar. We couldn't do it without you. I also invite you to watch our other webinars as we have equally as good and interesting speakers. Thank you again. <laughs>